Well, greetings, everybody, and it's a welcome to the live stream. Here we go. Uh, loads of people joining, um, loads of people waiting, and so that's great uh, that everyone's joining. I uh, saw a little note that uh, connected to LinkedIn's taking a bit of time, so hopefully LinkedIn will connect. So welcome, everybody. Um, a couple of bits and pieces. I remember, if you are here, uh, please uh, you know write the word question before the question, um, which already loads of people are doing, which is great and fantastic. And what I'm trying to do is, uh, based on some ideas and thoughts and feedback, is uh, just doing a couple of things slightly differently on the live stream. So if you are here watching afterwards, I will be trying to put chapter titles uh, against various questions so you can find ways of leaping forwards to the various questions. Also, what I'm going to be doing is uh, starting the every live stream with uh, a topic of the week and ending every live stream with a kind of a tip of the week. So uh, that's the plan of action. And the advantage of that is also as people are joining, getting their questions ready, uh, it gives uh, gives people a chance for people to join and so on and so forth. So the, what I, I've got a logo to bring up as well, which is, uh, there we go, topic of the week. Um, and as I said, we will end with, um, with uh, tip of the week. So um, in terms of the topic of the week, as you probably saw from the headline, it was really thinking around uh, excursions and cruise excursions, and partly because I've had a lot of questions coming in about excursions, but also um, I've been planning some of my excursions for my upcoming trip in July, uh, July? Can't really soon myself for, for January uh, for my South Africa trip. Um, and I got thinking around uh, maybe a couple of videos on the topic, but one of the things that struck me is I realized I have a kind of a set of criteria that I would always, always, always go on an excursion. So, uh, you know, I do like to self-explore a lot, like many people, but there are four times that I would choose, uh, always choose an excursion. So I thought I would share those with you and that may spark questions or more topics um, uh, as well later. To that. So the first time I would always choose a cruise excursion uh, is if I have any questions in my mind mind around the safety of a port. So that could be the whole country or could be an individual port. So for example, just this uh, last week or two, the State Department in the US has increased the level of uh, warnings against their traveling to Jamaica. So that's one port that I would probably, if I was seeing stuff like that, uh, focus on going more with the cruise line excursion. When I went to Egypt, for example, lots of issues around safety and whatever, so I'd stick with the cruise line. So if I ever have the slightest amount of doubt in my mind around safety, I would always go with the cruise line excursion. Uh, the second is distance. So if the port is a long way away from the sites that I want to see. So for example, on my last cruise, we were going to Livorno, which is a good hour and a half from Florence. I would always stick with the cruise line excursion. Uh, I might book a on your own, so it's just a transfer, but it, you know, it kind of keeps you in the system. The advantage is you normally have a, a contact number or so uh, for the, uh, the, the the person sort of supervising the transfer. So it just reduces in a huge amount of uh, concern or worries about that. The next um, reason is when it basically speeds things up or makes it much easier. And the two times. Not sure I'm saying four times, two times that is one, which is less applicable now. But it, there are some places, like for example, Russia, when you could go to Russia, where if you booked a cruise line excursion, you didn't need to get a visa, so you didn't have to go through all the hassle. So if there's any place like that, the other time is if it's a tender port. I will often choose to go on an excursion. So for example, particularly if it's a big ship. So like with Norwegian Viva, we had a couple of tender ports. And what would happen there is uh, first of all, the excursions would all go first. So they'd get off early and they would first. Then they would have priority for people in uh, the suites. And then you'd basically get a ticket and wait your turn. So the advantage then is if you get in a tender port, going on an excursion on the big ship is you can get out really quickly in, you know, and uh, you know, into the into the port uh, and save time. Also, if you have to go through, say, immigration, like once we went to Singapore, you know, it, I discovered by going on an excursion, you would go out first, you'd get through the immigration. Friends of mine that didn't found themselves kind of stuck waiting a couple of hours to get on, on onto the port. So those um, those were kind of the, the the three key reasons. There is a fourth key reason, which is if I'm going on a very high value, high risk excursion, I will also tend to cho choose a cruise line excursion. So for example, uh, that was kind of reinforced 
to me um, about the whole screening and stuff. If I'm spending a couple of hundred dollars to go on an excursion, uh, I want to make sure that the provider is really well screened. So, for example, when I was in Norway on my Disney Magic, I discovered talking to the helicopter pilot that they could only use certain pilots to do the helicopter tours for Disney because they had a requirement around the number of hours that someone had to have flown before they could do that uh, particular tour. So those are kind of the, the kind of the topic of the week, my kind of thoughts of the week. If you have any questions specifically related to excursions, please pop those and I will make sure I answer those. But of course, I will, of course, answer any other questions you've got. So let's start digging in. We've got loads of regulars here, Hetty, Claudia, Pika, uh, and so on. Not keep going through those, Beth, I can see Sarah, loads of regulars, which is always great to see. So let's get stuck into Heike's question. Um, I booked two different cruises with Norwegian for May 2025, and both were cancelled due to their fleet redeployment. Is this normal practice? So Heike, it has the last year or two been more common than kind of uh, one would like. Um, you know, obviously, cruise lines have to set their itineraries many years in advance, which is why you were seeing, for example, even China's not on many itineraries because they were planning so far in advance with uncertainty around China. Obviously, Russia's disappeared. I think we started to see as people reschedule around what's happening in Israel and the Middle East and so on. So what you're ha finding is they sometimes having to set way in advance and there are changes. So there's some big changes like Norwegians made some big changes with the that realized actually having a ship in a different place, I'm going to be able to sell it just so much better. Um, and that's so that's been quite common. We've seen some with celebrity last year. So it is definitely something that we're seeing happening as people reassess where demand and supply is, because obviously cruise lines want to uh, sell where the demand is and where ships are full. So it, it's not massively common. Um, unfortunately, I, Norwegian have been fairly uh, a little bit more active on those. Um, so it's not common, but it does absolutely, absolutely uh, happen. Um, Great mix of people, Jane, from Alberta. Barb, lots of snow. It's, it was a really, really cold here in the UK, and it's sort of like become less chilly, which is which is uh, which is quite good. Uh, GG, boarding simply the seas. Uh, got lots of people <laughs> talking about how dreary it is. Andrew um, has a question around uh, Queen's Grill. So, hi there, Andrew. My parents have booked a multi generational trip in Queen's Grill. Very nice. We have a nine month old. Won't bring him to dinner, but would you be upset seeing a quiet child at breakfast or lunch in the grill? So, Andrew, it's, it's a really interesting question because, you know, historically, um, as I think you're alluding to, is Cunard was very much by default an adult line. And certainly in Queen's Grill, you didn't have that many uh, kids at all. And people did get a little bit like, um, upset is probably too strong a word, uh, like sort of uh, less enthusiastic, shall we say, if people brought kids in. Um, so uh, it's very, I think it's very considerate of you not bringing a you know, kid in the evening. Obviously, that'll be well appreciated. Uh, it's like more adult experience. But no, um, you know, people won't be upset. I think the key thing is, uh, you know, uh, is, is disruption. So for example, we were on uh, Norwegian, when I was on Norwegian Viva, recently, obviously, I expected there to be more families, more kids. Um, so you kind of have to just factor that in. But some parents, of course, were letting kids just behave incredibly badly. And obviously, nine month old is much harder to, to control, if that's the right word. You know, but um, so, so I don't think people will be uh, will, will be upset. I mean, one of the things you might want to speak to uh, with Andrew is, which major these may factor in is say, look, you know, we're going to bring our nine year old, uh, a nine year old, nine month in old, you know, is there a good spot which works for you as a family and also for the rest of the uh, rest of the diners. You know, there might be a little corner where there's other families, for example, or particularly if you're keen on getting, if, if you want to get nine month old in and out for whatever reason. Um, so I would do that. So I don't think people will be upset, but you're right. A lot of people are expecting it to be more adult. And I've seen surprisingly on like MSC, when I was on MSC and I tried the Yacht Club, some people were really like not happy that kids were on there, which is to me really strange because it is a, you know, it's a family kind of experience. So um, I think people will be very appreciative that you're keeping dinner more, uh, more, you know, more adult. And I'm sure probably it's great for, for, for you as well. Now, I'm guessing that I don't know if Cunard have a babysitting service. So, Andrew, uh, uh, you know, some of the lines do have a babysitting service in the evenings. I'm not sure if you've uh, found that found that out uh, uh, yet. Calling all ports, great to see you here, which is uh, linked 
uh, to the topic of the week, as it were, excursions. So you mentioned in a recent video that you often prefer to self-exploring ports rather than take excursions. We do too. What are your some of your favorite cruise ports for self-exploring? Wow, that's a massive, massive, massive topic. So I think um, uh, you know one one of the one of the favorites. I think there's probably I'm sort of thinking aloud here, but there's probably three. If I think there's uh, there's probably three sort of groups of ports that I like uh, to self-explore, and one of which is particularly when I'm in the Caribbean. Uh, you know, very when it's very much around beaches and stuff. You know, in Caribbean, there's such a big infrastructure in place around you know getting to the best beaches, whether it's taxis or shared taxis or uh, you know day pass, resort passes, or, or whatever. So I think anything that's incredibly well structured for tourists and obviously is known to be kind of as a safe place. So particularly if I just wanted to do something lazy and whatever. The second one that I really like self-touring is actually those very uh, uh, kind of iconic ports, uh, which again are pretty well documented. So using the example I had of Florence earlier, but you know, Florence is uh, is incredibly well documented. You could find lots of information from the visitor center. You can find lots of information online that you can you know can download self uh, you know guided walks. Uh, you know you can use Google Maps and so on. Um, so I find you know those are, again are quite well structured, um, and it means I can spend as long or as little in places. The problem I find with going to like a tour of Rome, a tour of Florence, or whatever, is they've allocated you know half an hour at uh, this museum, half an hour at this bridge or whatever, half another site. I might actually want to spend an hour there or might want to spend 10 minutes at a place. So I always prefer those places. And what, again, I found with those big iconic places is they often have a hop on hop off bus. So even if the paces are quite spread out, you can easily get around. So Rome, for example, which is another port, um, you know, again, it's pretty easy to get around. Florence, you'd walk around. Rome, you'd walk around. So if there's, again, these iconic places um, I don't like going on the on the tours. Uh, like I did one, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, just before the, the pandemic shutdown of Rome, and it would drive me crazy. Because, partly because I wanted to photograph video stuff, but we would go somewhere, and then it was like you've got half an hour, you've got to be back. But maybe I want to take some pictures or want to spend longer. Then we'd all meet back, and then we'd have to wait for twenty minutes because someone was back late. So those are the things. The, the third one um, is uh, let's look at the third one is. Is places that I I just don't mind getting lost in, if, if you like. So places that I think you're going to stumble on places. So particularly places that aren't very well known, but I, you know, but I want to just go exploring. So you know, for example, when when I'm trying to think of some good examples. So like in when I did the Venice to Athens, you know, I, I, I've never been to Split before. Uh, I didn't know much about it, but I just like actually getting off and strolling around, uh, finding places I didn't. Never mind if I didn't see anything amazing, but it's just sort of places where it's fine to get lost. It's not very big. It's not very complicated. So that's probably those. But pretty much every port I, I do like to 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 self explore. I do get kind of frustrated even on that Japan trip. I mean, a lot more excursions than I would normally do because they were kind of included in the fare, and I did get a little bit frustrated because like I want to spend longer. Oh, you know, we went to <clears throat> excuse me, Nijo Castle in Kyoto, but I realized. Actually, to get back to bus on time, I've got literally 20 minutes. So I was like running around, it, and it's kind of not what I would, you know, the best way of, of doing it. Uh, Janet, this is something that I have been wondering as well, but I think I think it's probably okay. Is I have a saga cruise book for June. Would you be concerned with the news about financial difficulties? So for those people who don't know, Saga is uh, you know is a, a massive insurance company which also has a very big travel business which targets you have to be 50 and over to go or at least one of the people on the booking has to be 50 and over before you can go on it they have two cruise ships spirit of adventure spirit of discovery and they were in private equity they were then listed again and they have an enormous amount of debt and the ceo who's been in the last couple of years has resigned with quite short notice and there's been lots of stuff in the press around just the, the scale of debt they've got now they had been trying to sell uh, their underwriting business, which would generate quite a lot of money, I think 50 million pounds or something to help mark down that debt. So, Janet, overall, I would not be personally, and I guess I'm not, I'm a, you know, I, I don't have a crystal ball, I don't have an insight, but personally, I wouldn't be because certainly the cruise business is very vibrant. So, I think if they do hit issues, I'm pretty sure someone would, even if they pick up parts of, of, of the business as it, as it were. So, I think 
they do have a big, if I understand the financial, they have a big payment due uh, sometime next year, which I think the view is they can cover it. It's about the ongoing driving down the debt and what they're going to have to do to drive down the debt. Um, but I wouldn't be massively worried. I guess you're right, probably being cautious about looking too far ahead. But the cruising business is, you know, it's always sold out. It's always very popular. So that is a kind of a standalone business seems to be uh, seems to be okay. But again, I, 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 I don't know. But, you know, you might want to be cautious. Make sure you've got insurance, for example, in place, um, which I always recommend you have from the time you book a cruise anyway. Um, and, you know, pay your, maybe, I don't know, pay your final balance the last minute. You absolutely have to do that. Um, so obviously, we'll, I'll keep an eye out on what happens with, with that. Uh, I, as a little aside, it's terrible. I, I, I when Saga listed, I was very optimistic and I bought shares and they like it's one of the best, worst worst decisions I've ever made in terms of that. So that'll teach me. Um, so Robin, hi there, Robin. Good to see you again, Robin. How many landings did you do per day on your Greenland expedition with Habitat? And I remember last week, or if I remember correctly, you were asking about uh, doing doing two different types of cruises, if I remember, in that area. So basically, Robin, we we would do, uh, most days we would do two, two sort of activities. So normally one in the morning, one in the afternoon. Now, most of those were landings. We did do one or two that were zodiacs. So, for example, zodiac around the face of a uh, uh, glacier um, uh, in Canada. His name forgets me. Uh, gets a fan. So we did roughly two, which is... Fairly typical for expedition. You know, when I've been to the other parts of the Arctic or Antarctic before, we've normally done those kind of morning and afternoon. And most of them seem to try and do them. Now, obviously, some days we we did none because it was a sea day. Was we were moving between places, and obviously some days we might do one because we did something and then we were moving quite a long, quite a long distance. But you know, sort of the, the most days it would be it it would be two. Christina, uh, great timing of the question as we run up into Christmas. How many Christmas cruises have you taken and are they worth it? I understand it depends in what, on what one is looking for, a quiet, festive, et cetera. So I have done done two on Cunard, no, maybe three on Cunard uh, at Christmas one. So I've done at least four. So I've done three on Cunard, Queen Mary two. We did one on Holland America, uh, actually being on the ship on Christmas. Uh, and on the Queen Mary 2 also being there on New Year. So you're absolutely right. I think the key thing with Christmas is, uh, and I did a video around Christmas cruising um, around my last experience, which was on uh, Holland America Conningsdam, which was very different to my other experiences. I think the critical thing with Christmas cruises is, um, and what I've learned is you need to expect uh, a, a larger proportion of families and multi-generational trips, as you would expect. So even on cruise lines that traditionally uh, have a more adult spin. So Queen Mary 2, for example, we had 300, 400 kids. I believe there's many more now from the time we did it. Uh, Holland America, we had 400 kids. So obviously the ship is way fuller because those kids almost certainly, in mo no, most of those kids will be sharing cabins. So you're sailing over capacity. So things will be kind of very busy. Um, so, uh, you know, finding a quieter cruise, you probably need to rely more on a Viking, uh, for example, which is adult. And if you're looking for something that's a bit quieter, because you will find even ships that are have a reputation for being quieter do tend to be just busier just because of the, the mix kind of changes. Uh, the other thing linked to that is, uh, for example, what I, my learning was is by choosing to sell Conningsdam out of San Diego, there were very few options for families. Uh, to sell at Christmas. So, of course, they went on Holland America and Princess because those are the options. So it's also about choosing where you go. Other people that I know at the same time had chosen Holland America in the Caribbean for Christmas and then had much fewer families on, was a little bit quieter uh, from a, you know the, the, the family vibe because, obviously, you know, if you're a family, you've got a vast array of choices out of out of uh, out of uh, out of Florida, so it does depend a, a lot what you're looking for. And generally, my experience is a bit like when you go to Alaska. I feel like the lines are not atypical because the, the type of people who are cruising may not be atypical. They've cho chosen it because they want to go on. The other thing I would say is you find lots of uh, groups of families, uh, friends, and so on go on. So particularly, I think as a solo cruiser. Cruising on uh, a Christmas cruise is more difficult to kind of meet and break into uh, groups, I, I, I would say. But um, we we haven't been totally put off Christmas cruising, um, even though I'm not sure we have the, 
we had good experience, but not great experience. But we have booked another Christmas cruise, so it wasn't all uh, doom and gloom. But we booked on Region Seven Seas, but we're doing it's quite a longer cruise, which is another thing which I think influences it. So this cruise is sixteen nights uh, from Miami to Los Angeles by the Panama Canal. So again, the fact that it's a sixteen night cruise, it leaves quite early. It's uh, it's leaving on this like this fifteenth or sixteenth or fourteenth, no thirteenth, something like that of December and ends on the 30th, is that 69th? Anyway, it's roughly around that time. So again, it's a longer cruise, so you're less likely to have families and things on with school breaking up and stuff. But I think you, you're you right, you, you need to expect to be kind of more buzzy. I mean, it's also a great experience. Like when we were on the Queen Mary 2, you know, Father Christmas arrived, um, they had uh, elves and all sorts of stuff going on. So it, it can also be a great, a great lot of, a uh, great lot of, a uh, great lot of fun. Does that make sense? A lot of fun is what I'm saying. But you're right, it depends what you're looking for. Um, hi, the Moonlight Adventures. Uh, uh, I can't remember. Is that say midnight? Midnight Mavic. I can't quite read the little uh, slogan there. Uh, what are the best spots to visit in Southampton before cruise? Thanks in advance. So um, I tend to kind of head down to Southampton either the the, the, the day of the cruise, just heading down from home, um, or I do sometimes stay overnight, but maybe only arriving a bit later. So um, I I I. I I don't know a lot of places to visit in Southampton. Unfortunately, um, travel agent Sarah isn't here because she always is very defensive of Southampton. But um, there's a very nice maritime museum uh, there. I mean, there's more, I personally think there's more interesting places in Portsmouth, but that's a, a way away. You've got, uh, you know, so the New Forest just outside. Um, but, the, you know, um, I don't think there's a lot of places in Southampton. So people are more enthusiastic about Southampton, maybe you've got better tips than I have. But there is an interesting maritime uh, maritime museum there. There's a very nice little marina, which is where one of the hotels, uh, the Harbour Hotel is, which is also which is also pretty good. Uh, Sue Gordon is heading off on a Viking cruise, Australia, New Zealand, Tasmania in February. That'll be amazing uh, tip. Uh, Steve, oh, hi, good to see Steve here. Um, off topic, but the whole two-captain arrangement on Celebrity Descent Seems really odd and unsafe at worst. Any idea why they did this other than gimmick? Steve, um, I f suspect it is a very good PR uh, opportunity. I, I think, you know, they had made a lot of the fact that they obviously they've got uh, Captain Kate. Uh, they made a lot of, they have a very large, um, you know, diversity on the, uh, on the, um, on the bridge, they obviously are championing a lot of uh, women seafarers coming through. It did feel it's positioned a lot as a gimmick, and I'm not really sure whether they're really going to both be on at the same time. Uh, I mean, the impression you get is they're both going to be on the same time. In reality, you always do have two captains. Um, in fact, on board a ship, you've got the captain and the staff captain. So it's kind of like the boss and the 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 the, um, the one who's a little bit more focused on the nautical side, and one who's a little bit more focused on the on the, the staffing side. So in reality, there's always two captains. You'll, you'll find uh, at many of the introductions you'll have, this, I'm the captain, it's the staff captain. So I suspect it's that arrangement in practice. Uh, I know some of the videos they've posted; they're both on on deck and they're both on, on the bridge and stuff. But I suspect that, and obviously we'll 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 watch that. But there will always there has to be a hierarchy. I'm I'm pretty sure. I mean. I, I don't know for 100%, but that, that's my that's my impression. And Hedy was saying, yeah, they are alternating. That was my thought. Is they're also they're also alternating. Uh, Christina B has just got a follow up on the question: the best sports for Christmas, New Year's. Yes, I think you know, a lot of that hinges around what you want to do. I, mean, I personally like going where it's hot because it's cold, it's wet, it's horrible in the UK. So I love going to the Caribbean. They are very busy ports, but they are just fantastic. So it's sun and sand. Uh, and you'll find most of the ships, uh, you don't have a lot of choice in reality because most of the ships are going to be in the Caribbean or they're going to be down in Australia because that's where the season is. So it's, it's you know, you're not going to have, you could do the odd one in in in, uh, in, in Europe, but there's not very many ships uh, at all. So hi, KB in the QK. Thank you. You give me a nice little segue into talking about my talking about my group cruises. So um, hi, Gary. Uh, do you know how many people you have on the waiting list with September group cruise, especially for balconies? So, KB, just uh, I was talking to Sarah just before she headed off. There's there's, there's four couples um, on the waiting list. Um, we are letting you know people more people can join the waiting list. And if you are interested in the September group cruise, let me see if I've got a picture of that that I can bring up. Uh, let me bring the picture up. Um, sorry, KB. Uh, uh, sorry, let me just see if I can take that up. I'm not 
because it's probably worth showing that. So the top, the, the, the two group cruises that I've got going is in April is a members and patrons one. So you have to be a member patron to go on that one. Then the September one is, is I always get this mirror, is uh, a celebrity one which goes out of Boston. Uh, so originally that that was sold out. Um, and the cruise itself was selling extremely full. Now, uh, just before uh, Sarah went away, Celebrity have indicated that there is a chance that they will be able to give us more cabins uh, as we head into January, because there is another, some other groups, I believe, on that particular cruise, and the cruise is selling really well. Um, but they have indicated there's a strong chance that we can get more cabins. So what I'm encouraging you, if you are interested in that group cruise, anybody, uh, please, uh, you know, go to, uh, if you go to the website, tipsforshivers.com, as you see there, click in the mirror you'll see a little tab there called group cruises uh, and click on that and it gives you the details that you need to send to sarah now you won't hear from sarah until january on that she is away although she does have someone doing backup but we won't have we've agreed with, with celebrity we will come back to them early january uh, you know the first week of january or so um and discuss what capacity they've got uh, the good news also kb is that generally speaking that seems to be across the board although i'm not sure on the sweet situation but you're not talking about the sweets sweets sweet situation uh as you know many cruises they tend to sell at sweets first so the good news is uh if you are interested in that group cruise it looks like we are going to be able to open um get, get some more cabins so that's very exciting um uh, a few other bits why we talk about the group cruise is um i've been doing some work with the meet boston team and they are going to be laying on a, a, a reception which won't cost anything for anybody so it'll be food and drinks and stuff um for everybody who wants to come. Uh, about 99, 98% of the people on the group cruise are interested in coming. There's about 80 something people on the group cruise at the moment. Um, also, there is a, going to be an, a tour organized by the Meet Boston group uh, of some Boston highlights. Now, there may be a small charge for that, but that'll be in the afternoon before. So there's gonna be a few other bits and pieces as well. So that's very exciting. I'm just waiting for them to lock it down. There's also going to be a hotel package with different range of hotels, which they are a little bit late in getting back, but I guess that's complicated. Um, but before Christmas, we should have that. So definitely, if you are interested in the group cruise, please, please, please uh, do that. And we will hopefully, first week of January, or in the first 10 days of January, be able to confirm that. So great. It sounds like you might be on the waiting list, KB. So that's 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 very great. Um, so let's have a look. Dean asking the question. Um, is there an advantage on annual travel insurance plans versus individual plans? We're going on multiple cruises in the future. So Dean, um, obviously again, with the proviso, I'm not a uh, insurance expert as such, but um, I'll tell you what I do and what feels like the right thing to do. So personally, like you, you know, I have multiple cruises. I go for annual travel insurance because then the advantage with annual travel insurance is it means that if I'm canceling a future cruise, I have it in place because you'd always have insurance from the time you take out a cruise. Because if you cancel, you, you may find that um, you can't get things back. So particularly in the UK, for example, you can only get non-refundable deposits. So if you cancel pretty much for any reason, even if it's a medical reason, the cruise lines won't give you your money back um, because that's the terms and conditions. Where if you've got insurance, you can maybe make some claims uh, back on that depending on previous conditions and that sort of stuff. So I tend to go for the overall. For me, I've worked out now, I also, because I have existing conditions with my kind of cancer situation, uh, being in remission and so on, so I need to have medical cover, uh, insurance that covers that, so it's much easier to do on an annual basis. Uh, and so it actually seems to work out more cost effective and it's much less hassle. So that's, the, so the advantage is, you know, you, you don't have to worry about, oh, I've got that cruise, I need to make sure I've got insurance to cover that cruise I'm doing September next year, in case I have to cancel it, and it's done, and it's one price. Um, now, I'm from what I understand, um, is not every country you can get annual insurance in necessarily. So I know people from the US uh, seem to have more of more of an issue from what people have told me. One of the things I, I people have asked me to do is to do maybe a video diving into insurance much more, but I need to find some good really good partners uh, to, 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 to do that. But that, that's my thoughts, Tom. And what's good is Tom is coming from Facebook on that. So as you know, the live goes live on Facebook, LinkedIn, although it looked like there was a problem with thing, although I can see a tick now, it looks like it's going. And uh, also on, of course, uh, YouTube. So uh, the Wu-Tang Live, hi, good to see you again. When booing, I think booking that excursion on your own, how much money you save, percentage, 10% or 20% compared to booking with a cruise line? So again, uh, Wu-Tang, it's a little bit like how long is a piece of string? It depends on the tour and the complication, but you can easily save 20% or more. 
So, um, you, you know, and it, it depends a little bit on what kind of what excursion you're doing, but it can be fairly substantial because you bear in mind what the cruise line is doing is they are buying a tour from a tour up, so they're partners. So they might partner with, so say Norwegian group uh, partners with, um, uh, not inside travel. Anyway, they have, there's a travel company that, that they, so they buy all the tours from them. They then make a markup on that, you know, a hefty markup on that. I mean, so so you can make a big savings. I mean, and always do have a look. So, for example, I'll give you an example, which is not you know, from an independent provider. But when I was on that uh, Norwegian Viva trip, they, trip, they were offering a hop-on-hop-off bus ticket you could buy in advance. It was like 70 euros, 70 dollars, so I say, which is about 65 euros. Uh, no, but it's about the same. It's, it's not quite the same, but say let's right it's roughly about 70 euros, 70 US dollars. It's actually 75 US dollars or 70 euros. Anyway, and um, but if you just walked off the ship, went down the escalators, the hop on hop bus was there and they were selling a day pass for 35 euros. So they were almost doubling the price. Now, I don't think they actually double the price in excursion, but you can easily be saving kind of in the scale of, of, of 20%. And it's very easy to do, to compare, because if you go to sites like VentureAssure.com, ShoreExcursionsGroup.com, the good news is you can just put in your, uh your your cruise line put in your ship put in your date of departure and it will bring up all the excursions so it's quite easy to then just because you don't have to go hunting you know searching barcelona blah, blah, blah. it'll bring up all the ports all the excursions so it's quite easy to do the comparison bearing in mind of course that um uh you know often the groups will be smaller which is which is which is which is great um so so let's have a look remember to write the word question r bill hi good to see you bill uh, would an excursion to Berlin fall in the category of being too far from the ports? The better choice? Yes, absolutely. I mean, Berlin is really far. Is it Wurtung? I can never pronounce the name. Um, Berlin is really far from the port. I think that's a good two or so hours. So I definitely would do. I mean, there is options to get trains and things, but it is really, really far from the port. And it, in the back of my mind, would always be like, oh my goodness, it's uh, many hours back. So I personally, I didn't, when I, I when I went to the, the port, I didn't actually do the Berlin one because I'd been to Berlin not so long ago. Um, but absolutely, I would do that. And, they, and the lines will do that uh, on your on your own, uh, on your own trip. Um, so, so definitely. Uh, Michelle, uh, if you have a snorkel before, is it worth it to take a snorkel excursion? I really like snorkeling, so I'm going to be a little bit biased, Michelle. But definitely, if you're comfortable in the water, if you like swimming, then I would definitely try snorkeling um, because snorkeling is actually not very difficult at all um, in, in reality. And they are pretty good at explaining, uh, you know, in those places that are very big in snorkeling, Caribbean and those sort of places, um, you, you know, they were pretty good at explaining how the mask works, you know, how to put on the mask, uh, where you put your, the, 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 you know, the, what you might call it, the, <laughs> band um and so on and uh you know how to breathe and, and stuff through that uh, and certainly you know there are some snorkeling is amazing um you know one of the things uh, you know which is probably more niche than this is when i went to the galapagos one of the things that they hadn't really spoken about and i talk about it in my video is they hadn't spoken about how a massive part of what you see in the galapagos is under the water in the water so if you don't snorkel you're going to miss out on an enormous amount. And I did see, you know, we saw sharks, we saw rays, we saw seals, uh, penguins, and the most incredible fish, the same in French Polynesia. So there are amazing things to see. Um, so if you're comfortable in the water, and the advantage, if you get in, try the snorkeling, and after two minutes you don't like it, you can get out and you just enjoy the catamaran ride. So I, I would give it a go. Uh, you obviously need to be comfortable in the water and swimming um, as well. So uh, if you're comfortable with that, then definitely. Joy, um, another great question on cruise excursions. With respect to cruise excursions versus DIY, would you have additional considerations for the solo driver? Joy, I do actually have a good point. I do have one or two. Going on excursions is a great opportunity as a solo traveler to connect and meet with people. So, um, you know, one of the things I found, for example, particularly, um, you know, in the Caribbean, uh, it's actually a great link to the snorkeling. Obviously, I'm I'm not going to go south exploring snorkeling because I need a catamaran to get to the you know, the places or the sites. You know, if you're heading out to where there's a reef or a uh, shipwreck or something. But what I found is, uh, because I would go on a, say a couple of snorkeling ex excursions uh, and, and maybe a couple of beach 
excursions or so, is the same people tend to do the snorkeling ones. If you're into zip lining, the same people do the zip lining ones. So it is really a great way as a solo traveler just to start connecting to people because obviously on the bus, you might sit next to somebody when you're waiting to queue, if you're sitting on the catamaran. So I think excursions are really a good way for solo travelers. Also, they obviously give more security uh, if you, you know, particularly if you're a little bit nervous about the places you're going to or not sure uh, about, you know, where is this a good safe port, isn't this a safe port. So it gives you that added level, added level of security and there's that sense of, okay, someone is there looking after you, keeping an eye on you. So even if you're doing the on your own excursion, the, you know, the, the, the tour guide will give you a little, you know, give you their number if you're stuck. So if you're feeling uncomfortable or something, um, you have that. So I think, you know, it's definitely a good way of meeting people. So I have often ended up starting chatting to people um, that you then see around the ship and, you know, may build uh, kind of friendships, uh, friendships. But in this case, I do not have um, the answer to this. Um, so if anyone does have the answer to this, that would be great. Now, Midwest Kate, um, I think I'm right in saying that cruise monkeys, so Gavin and Luke, I feel like they live near here. So they may be a good person to ask because uh, they know their lay of the land. So, and if you follow them at all on YouTube or follow them on, uh, uh, you know, on Facebook or whatever, Cruise Monkeys, they would be a really good, uh, they, they will definitely be able to answer that. I have never been on a cruise to Hollyhead Wales. My run UK cruises have never called that. Jerry, um, hi there. Good to see you, Jerry. Have you ever, have you ever nearly missed the ship when doing an independent excursion? Have you ever witnessed peer owners? So on the first part, no. Um, because I am obsessed with <laughs> with not missing the ship, which is why a little bit why I talk about I like being linked when I do even on those longer for for the way at once. So I'm 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 not also partly because I tend when I'm in a port and I'm self exploring get kind of get off early, head out. So I'm sort of heading back um, well before the time. So I am very kind of linked to that. Also, what I always always do is I always take. A photograph of the daily program which has the port agent in so i know that i have if i am struggling i can phone the port agent uh, some cruise lines very few will give you the, the number for the ship but i'd have some i know i've got someone that i can phone to say look i'm running i'm running late because often the ship just wants to know uh, you know obviously some of that lead have i ever witnessed peer runners i haven't witnessed many of them that that's not true i've only uh, ever witnessed one and that was when i was on uh the region navigator in the Caribbean at the beginning of this year. We were in St. Martin and we were a little bit late in leaving, like maybe 20 minutes, half an hour, but up until then we'd been around time. And uh, they did that announcement, which you always hear, which is Will, Mr. and Mrs., you know, Mr. Uh, Jerry Capsec of room 771, uh, con contact the reception or guest services, you know, if it's at all aboard time, that means the people haven't arrived back. And they did that announcement again, again. And then the captain came around and said, look, uh, we're going to be leaving. And uh, you might have heard, we've been trying to find somebody. They haven't gone back to the ship. And we were starting to, you know, they, they literally were starting to then finally bring the, 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 the gangway. And we saw these people coming along, like sort of coming along, uh, trying to run. They weren't uh, particularly mobile and they, they weren't very runny and then one of the guys um jumped into one of those little golf buggies and actually charged up and got them in the golf bag. so i sort of saw them uh, trying to kind of peer around if you like um and then get rescued so that's the same time i've actually seen it so uh, maybe i've gone cruises where people are more more like me a little bit more obsessed um so uh let's have a look question from norma we're going on our first Oceania and Cigna on September the 8th. Do we need plastic luggage checkups? Normally, you don't need plastic luggage holders. You know, it's, you'll be able to print off online, you know, the paper one, you can fold it up to staple it, so it's perfectly fine. Um, I like the plastic luggage holders, uh, personally, largely, to be honest with you, because I don't, I, I like to, um, I just don't have a staple with me or whatever. If you're staying in a hotel the night before, when I check out, I can say, can I have a staple or whatever. So I actually just quite like the plastic ones. Um, because um, then I can just have them preset uh, before I go. I just put them on my case. Um, you know, if you don't have your luggage tag, you can, when you go to hand over your bag, they will write one out for you. So you don't need them. I just like them. And a lot of cruisers do like them. Um, so, so that's, uh, that's good. Um, but no, you, you, you don't, you don't, you don't need them as such. Um, Randy, hi there. We will be on Seabourn Sojourn in June. 
uh, with stops in the Canary Islands. Any suggestions for excursions other than beaches? Always enjoy watching videos. So thanks very much. Randy, I don't, but probably in a couple of weeks' time, I will have a better <laughs> suggestion. So I haven't been, I've never been to the Canary Islands once in my life, and that was on a land based trip uh, to the to Grand Canaria in my youth, um, which was like a, you know, one of those inexpensive package holidays the sort of partying kind of holiday. So I don't know the Canary Islands terribly well, but I'm going next year on Queen Anne, uh, which we go to all of the, I think all of them we're going to. Um, but I haven't yet started looking at um, the excursions other than my dentist receptionist, who I was talking to, who knows Canary Islands really well in Tenerife, said to me about this uh, volcano in Tenerife that I absolutely must go to. So I don't know, but if anybody else does have good tips, both for me and for Randy, that would be greatly, greatly appreciated. So if you listen to this even afterwards um, and you have amazing uh, suggestions on must-do excursions, please let me know. You can uh, drop a comment on this video um, or email me at gary at tipsfortravelers.com. I would love to have those. And Randy, if I get good tips, I will I will definitely add, add, those, add those in. Um, Good, so a lot of people talking about ports that are easy, self-explored, Barcelona, Bergen, definitely great uh, pits. Uh, Cla Claude uh, is asking about Astoria, Oregon. I don't have any recommendations for those either. Um, I didn't even know that a crew stopped at Astoria, Oregon, so that's very interesting. What, maybe, Claude, if you could, I'd be interested to know what cruise it is that's calling in there. Maybe you can drop a little comment. I'd, I'd be very interested in that. Uh, I've never been there. Whenever I see a place I've never been, it's sort of one of those places that I immediately want to go to. So I'd love to know what cruise that is. Um, uh, what what credit is? I don't have any suggestions. If anyone does have, um, uh, definitely definitely have a, a look at that. Um, remember, write the word question so I don't miss anything. Oh, look, Andrew said answer the question. I have a free nursery in the evening. That's okay. So they have the free nursery, but they don't have the, the babysitting. I was I forgot that they open in the evenings for dinner. So that's a good one, Andrew. Some cruise lines then you can have babysitting in your cabin, but that's great. The, the nursery in the evening is great. But you're right. This, this, there there are very few. That allow so so the other one Andrew is MSC they have a toddlers uh, one as well and they do also have uh, you pay extra for the for the um, the, the, the in cabin babysitting <clears throat> but you're right there aren't many that do have that so that thanks for adding that in uh, here's a question that I didn't miss um, what is a good location or cruise line for a person in their 90s which is not overwhelmed with tons of people and is wheelchair friendly so Joy if you are based in the UK. Uh, Saga is perfect um, because they they are catered for the 50 plus, but they tend to have a, a, an older profile, um, you know, 70s, 80s, 90s. Uh, you'll find many 70s, 80s, 90 year olds on. They are incredibly well uh, structured for that. Also, if the UK lives like Fred Olsen is another a, a good option. Now, if you're talking um, uh, out of the UK, um, I would say you, know, you don't want to be overwhelmed by people. So you, you're really looking at smaller ships. Uh, I would take a look at maybe Viking. I'd, it is more pricey. It is more costly. But again, they they you know the, although the average age of people won't be in their 90s, but they will certainly be uh, well kind of catered and 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 uh, uh, you know uh, able, able to cope uh, and understand requirements uh, and so on. So if you're talking about destination, um, you know. The, Again, uh, depending on how much you want to get off in the ports, uh, but you know, again, uh, you know, an interesting um, Mediterranean itinerary, or even like I was talking earlier, the Panama Canal, where you know the advantage is you can spend time out on deck, uh, you know, watching passes the Panama Canal. Um, so uh, I would avoid places that have very active. You know, so I would tend to avoid expeditions, you know, and Arctic, Arctica, uh, even Alaska to a degree. Uh, uh, because a lot of some of the best places are kind of fairly active places, uh, I, I would say. Um, so uh, help people also talking about uh, giving some more tips on ports. So thanks for everybody for um, for having uh, for adding in tips on on ports, which is very very helpful to see. Um, uh, uh, Jolene, good to see you here again. Uh, we're considering a multi generational cruise with kids. And six and nine year old grandkids. Other than Disney, what cruise line are to me to recommend for seeing some cruise? Jolene, I, I, you know, Royal Caribbean is a phenomenal cruise line for kids. Um, you know, obviously Carnival. I was listening to a podcast uh, with someone from Carnival who was being uh, interviewed, and they were talking about something 
the, the percentage of people who travel with kids was something like 40 or 50 percent of, of people travel with kids on Disney. Uh, sorry, on, on Carnival. Now, Carnival may not be, you know, may, may not be right for you, um, particularly if you're looking for more of a kind of a Disney vibe. You know, Royal Caribbean uh, just have incredible kids clubs, incredible activity for, for kids. Um, they have so much to do. They are, you know, when I was on there, they, they ran these little, um, uh, you know, fairs in the, the boardwalk, which had face painting and balloons and cupcakes. And then they were always doing stuff. Uh, the, the program was phenomenal. Um, you know, it's obviously quite a busy uh, cruise, but the advantage is probably for the adults, you know, you're going to have the incredible shows as well. You're going to have lots of good dining options. I mean, there are extra. Um, so I, I, I tend to sort of steer people uh, towards that. I mean, Nor Norwegian uh, is is a good option as well, but I feel Norwegian is a is more adulty, probably more teens kind of kids thing. Um, so that would be my thought. So Jerry um, has uh, let's have a look. So it just popped up. So let me find Jerry's one because I, I'd like to jump to these because they do tend to on my system disappear when they pop up as um, uh, super chats. So Jerry, thank you very much for the super chat. Um, I'm going on a Holland America cruise with excursions that include catamarans. I have some limitations of mobility. Are catamarans in respect to boarding and disembarking? So, Jerry, um, they are fairly tricky. So, um, because you'll normally, you know, docked in a bay, you know, if there's a bit of swell, it's going to be moving up and down. You're normally walking on a little kind of fairly narrow kind of gang plank. Uh, depending on the tide, it, you, it might be a little bit low, a little bit. It wouldn't be high because it'd be flooding. It might be a little bit low, a bit of bobbing around. So um, the it's not it's not it's 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 not impossible, um, but depending on mobility, I would be cautious. What I would strongly recommend is when you're on board, I would just go and see the shore excursions people, uh, and because it may differ by cataran by cataran depending on the cataran. Although the catarans are largely the same type, but I have been on some which are smaller which would be a little bit more challenging to, to get on because you're boarding and often you're then stepping down into the seating area, for example. Uh, if you want to go to the bathroom, for example, that will be down um, a, a very steep step, step ladder, uh, you know, and it's like almost like a ladder type to get into the bathroom, which should be below. So that would be very challenging with mobility. It's even, you know, being with, without limited mobility, it's kind of, you know, people are kind of a little bit all. Um, so, so I, but I would go and check with them if there are uh, some that they recommend more. Because what Coral America is very good at is they are very good at classifying their excursions. I think they're one of the best at classifying their excursions. So I would just go and double check um, which ones they, which, which ones they are. But it, it's, you know, it's not, it's not massively problematic. And obviously, they're used to. Generally speaking, most of the little. Um, uh, you know, gangways will often have little, they can't really hold on to them, it's just probably falling up, but there'll be some stuff there, that there'll, there'll be crew on either side to help people on and off. But it is kind of challenging, um, depending on your 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 amount of, of mobility. Um, but, you know, Canarang excursions are great. If you go to somewhere like St. Lucia and going on Canarang to, to the Pitons, and stuff, it's very beautiful and just sailing around some of the places. I, I, I really do like that. Jolene talking about how missing is burning out of gas. Um, that yeah, that's not <laughs> that doesn't sound fun at all. Uh, MM, uh, I also don't drink caffeine. Uh, will cruise lines ever stock more caffeine-free options if you let them know in advance? MM, um, uh, I'm not so sure about that. Um, and the reason I say that is, you know, cruise lines work to these massive big supply chains, which is why also cruise lines don't. Uh, flex their menus that much based on the regions so like we we're in japan we just had the normal like the menus that they always have you know it'd be the opera of sushi or something but that was they do that anyway um so so they have a very set strict kind of system now if you're going very premium so you are going to regent seaborn silver sea etc uh i guess the you know crystal now um you know they they may make more of an effort um, you know, to, to try to certainly to find it, but they also may stock it more. Um, hopefully, I, I do hope they bring in more caffeine-free options. Um, just you know, as a trend moves, like it's moving with more vegetarian options or so. But um, I'm not sure that it will. By letting them in advance, it's not very much that 
in terms of the flex of the supply chain would be my perspective. Um, and it is a challenge because generally speaking, most of the mainstream cruise lines, other than the premium cruise lines, do not stock things like cabin free Diet Coke, for example. Uh, there's many, many cruise lines that are going that don't have it. Uh, it's pretty much only once I get into, you know, if you're in a region to Seaborn, Silver Sea kind of stuff. So I'll be interested to see with the Silver It's been a while since I've been on Silver Sea uh, Classic. So we'll see whether they have that, whether they have that in, in, in January. Uh, Dean, <clears throat> we got spoiled on a recent Viking river cruise. Yes, I'm sure. Uh, booked again on an ocean cruise and another river cruise. What competitors are there at that level plan to go to Japan in the near future? Okay, so I think you're asking about ocean. So let me talk about, I'll talk about both just in case you want to know both. So in terms of ocean, um, there are broadly speaking, now there aren't any fixed firm definitions of categories within the cruising, but broadly speaking, what happens is you have uh, sort of the mass or resort uh, lines, you then, which is your uh, MSC, Carnival, Royal Caribbean, um, Norwegian. You then have what's known as premium, where you'll have Virgin now, Holland America, Celebrity, Princess, um, so on. Then you'll have sort of small ship luxury. And that's really, you know, ships of about a thousand passengers or fewer, um, but not yet the ultra luxury, which is the other category. So Vikings very much in that small ship luxury category. Um, so in there, you'll have Windstar, uh, you've got um, as as Amara, you've got uh, obviously Viking. Those are the three key ones. Now, Sea Dream. Some people argue should that should they be there or or not there, um, but those are the main ones. So I would tend to say Viking, Windstar, Azamara are the critical ones, and the other one which I'm a massive big fan of, which I never forgot, which is is Oceania. So Oceania is uh, is um, uh, the Norwegian groups. Uh, brand in there. Interestingly speaking, Carnival don't have anything operating in there. Royal Caribbean used to have Azamara, but of course they sold out of Mara. So I would say the closest to Viking is Oceania. Um, their ships are slightly bigger, depending on which they have some which are basically 700 passengers, which are the old R-class ships. Their newer ships are more like 1,200, so bigger than Viking. So Vikings in between those two. But Viking and Oceania are the closest. Windstar have smaller ships. Uh, as Mara have have small ships, uh, small ships as well. But those are the ones that I would look at. Jane left a super chat thing. Thanks very much, uh, Jane Duffy. Very much uh, uh, appreciated. Um, so uh, yeah, as the point, someone made the point. Obviously, you you do often find um, obviously things like um, Sprite uh, and those sort of things. My problem is I want diet. I want caffeine free and no sugar. That's what I have a problem. So I'm looking for Sprite Zero rather than Sprite. But you're right, there are lots of those other points. So that's a that's a really good that's a really good point. Um, <clears throat> so let's have a look. American Cruise Line stopped at Astoria, Lewis and Clark theme cruise. Right. Thank you very much. Someone added in where those ports are. So I'm just looking at where people have mentioned uh, that uh, that Astoria stops. So there's actually quite a lot that go there. And it's, uh, afterwards, I'm going to go. I always go back and look at all the comments and questions afterwards. So it sounds like I've got some some new some new uh, itineraries to 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 add to my uh, uh, to add to my to my list, which is always growing, which is great. Sergio Santos, how much responsibility does the cruise line have for how bad guests treat other guests? Oh, that's interesting. Um, I mean, in reality, they it, they have security teams and they will try and clamp down on bad behavior. Um, there was a, quite a big uh, stuff blew up around <clears throat> recent Pino Cruises, Arbia um, cruise, where uh, there was a well-known celebrity, I think I spoke about it on a previous thing, a singer called Gareth Gates, um, who was one of the finalists uh, of X Factor. He's very well known. In the UK, he performs quite a lot on Pino ships, and he posted a video about how uh, he basically people making fun of his stutter um, in, in the cabin next door, and they were basically eventually he didn't want to cause a fuss. Uh, I think Cruise Line didn't seem to really get involved, um, and his girlfriend eventually went and we've had enough of it and confronted them. But then it the, the all kind of blew out. But also on that same cruise, Ben and David, uh, you know, cruise with Ben and David, uh, had commented how they'd had some. Um, you know, they had some people being quite homophobic against them. Um, uh, and what it transpires is there was other bad behavior on that cruise and the captain actually disembarked some passengers 
from uh, that crew's for bad behavior. So the, the captain ultimately has the ability to disembark people if they badly behave. So I think obviously for the cruise lines, it's quite uh, challenging when they have bad behavior, but you know, it is their responsibility to make it a safe space overall. So Carnival um, famously over the last couple of years has issued uh, these sort of notices to people talking about how they expect people to behave and how they will disembark more people uh, for bad behavior. So they do have a responsibility. Um, and I guess this, it, it, it varies a little bit in terms of, I guess, what, what they're doing. Um, so I haven't, I mean, I haven't seen that in practice a lot, but maybe that's because I've been dealt with a lot or, you know, I've been lucky enough not to, not, not to, not to encounter that. Um, so, uh, but they do have a responsibility and they do have a security team. I think the key thing is often raising it with the cruise line uh, and the captain does have, does have uh that does have the responsibility there now i feel like i'm missing some questions just remind me to write the word question so make sure i don't miss your question i spotted one here we go uh brand so sorry if you before that i have missed your question uh uh brand i hope that's how you pronounce your name uh we have norwegian fjords cruise book for next june very nice you get to olden flam tabanga and hogansand hogansand can't miss excurs excursions. Now, the last one I'm not familiar with, I don't think, unless I'm thinking of Porto Wind. Um, for Alden, uh, my favorite excursion in Alden is the uh, the Lone Skylift, which is when you in the port they sell tickets. At, come back to the point, if you buy an excursion, uh, you know, the cruise line will offer it. You don't need to buy the, the, the excursion to the Skylift because normally they sell the tickets um, on the port. The shuttle bus uh, runs from the port regularly. They just go backwards and forwards to the Skylift. Um, so it's cheaper and easier. And in fact, when I, what, what I realized, MSC were just sending people, when I was on MSC there, they were just sending people onto the North shuttle bus. So there's no benefit at all. So I would do the Skylift. It's absolutely stunning and beautiful. So it's a cable car, absolutely incredible. Flam, I would absolutely do the train. Um, Make sure to book that one in advance. Again, you can, you can book direct um, uh, as well, or you book through cruise line. But absolutely, the train is really magnificent. Uh, in Savanga, I would recommend personally. I would do one of the boat trips which head into the fjord, uh, which I think is called Lysa Fjord, um, but double check that. Um, which will then go um, sail down to uh, Pulpit Rock. I always call it Pilgrim, uh, Pilgrim Rock for some reason, but I think it's called Pulpit Rock, uh, and it's beautiful scenery. Uh, if you are very active, uh, which looks like you might be very active uh, based on your picture there, I'm just drawing because you're looking out, outdoorsy and got scenery there. Um, if you are feeling active, there's a very great hike. Um, it's quite a long hike, pretty, pretty active, where you can actually go and stand on the pulpit rock. So that's something to do. Now, Hogan Sand, I, I, I don't know that port. Uh, there's a port with a similar name, which I suspect I'm going to be wrong, which is near uh, Garanga Fjord. But the other thing which I love doing which they may do is most of these do RIB tours. So I'd have to take a look at, at Huggins and and look if they do some RIB boat trips, which go kind of uh, right deep into the, the fjords. Those are uh, those I love, love, absolutely uh, love doing those. And I'm going to give you as my tip of the week. If you hang around everybody for my tip of the week, I'm going to actually give Brand uh, the best way of answering that question as, as a, as, <clears throat> as, as a, uh, as a question of the week. So, um, I uh, we're madly heading out of time, so I will try and answer a couple of quick questions for much of the week. David, hi, joining us from Facebook. Viking or Windstar, which would you rank highest? Thank you. So it's it's very interesting uh, challenge because I think it does have a kind of a different experience. Personally, I would probably, in terms of the overall experience, probably rank Viking slightly higher just because I think they are trying to push more at the boundaries of being more like the ultra luxury lines. So the ships are very open and new, they're very beautiful, the cams are very beautiful, the food is really high, you have much more choice of venues uh, than you would have on Windsor because the Windsor ships are much smaller. Um, so I think, you know, overall I would say probably they have a, uh, they also have incredible uh, um, enrichment programs. So they normally have a speaker on board and a, a historian on board. So just from that overall experience. Now Windstar, however, is a different experience that the ships tend to be much smaller. So Viking, if I remember correctly, is 900 passengers and the, all the ships are the same. Windstar have different types of ships that the sailing ships. So if you want that experience, then obviously you can't get that on Viking or get that on Windstar. They also have the old seaborne ships, which they extended pride 
Um, and why have I forgotten the names of the other ones? Anyway, um, uh, so they 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 are about three. If I'm going to correct, about 350 passengers. So it's dramatically smaller experience. So it's a much more intimate experience. So it's again a little bit of what you want for. I would say in terms of the luxurious side of it, it feels anyway to me more luxurious on biking. Again, because it's just that little bit bigger, you have more choice and so on. Um, uh, I think the service is amazing on Viking. Uh, you know, not that service is bad on Windstar, but it's a very kind of experience. So if you want a definitely a smaller, more intra intimate, slightly more relaxed in, in many ways, um, you know, a smaller daily program, not as much enrichment and stuff. So, so that's how it is. But if you were saying, you know, so I would, you know, it's, it's a little bit like um, depending on what it's one of those, depending on which you, depending on which ones. Uh, you know which ones, uh, which ones you you, 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 you kind of which of those experiences you like. But if I was just do rank, ranking around sort of a, a a luxury experience, defining luxury as having more choice, uh, then I would probably put biking. If you're doing in terms of the intimate experience, then I would definitely say it is it is uh, it is Windstar. Um, so I've made my bets there, I guess, a little bit. But right, so we have churned through an hour. So I, what I am going to do is I am going to leave, talk very quickly about my tip of the week. And I will, as I said, uh, uh, so that's topic of the week. So let me first of all take uh, the comments off um, and get the right branding thing up. Tip of the week. And this is a thing that's also linked up to the overall theme when, as we talk around uh, excursions. And also a good point uh, back to Brandt's question around what to do in what port. And my go-to uh, resource whenever I'm looking at a port is what's in port.com. Now I have mentioned this before, so it's what's in port.com. You can see it what's in port there. It's it's a fairly old looking fashion looking site, but it is phenomenal. I put Cape Town here because that's the next actual cruise port that I'm going to. But what's in port.com is pretty much even the most obscure of ports you will find on there. And I and it talks about how safe it is. It talks about where the ship docks, how far it is from uh, the sites, what the public transports are like, what the must-see sites are, what the currency is, what time the banks are open, what time the shops are open. Uh, it's just a mine of information, even though it looks kind of a little bit messy, and not messy, a little bit old-fashioned. It's kept very well up to date. So that is kind of my tip of the week. Um, I, my video this week is about Region 7 Seas, so um, uh, where I dive into Region 7 Seas. Um, the next live stream will be next uh, week on Sunday, and I think that will be the last live stream that I can confirm that I will be doing, because then I'm heading off on my travels. Uh, I'll be in Australia, and I don't know whether I'll be able to do live streams or not. So next week will absolutely be a live stream usual time on Sunday uh, may or may not be the last one of the year so we'll see uh, how that goes so thanks so much for joining I will check all the questions see if I can answer those but have a great great rest of the weekend I really appreciate you joining take care